I'm going to give you a list of questions. If you support those answers to the questions, you can shout, scream, <laughs> clap, or post on Twitter. So are you happy? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are you healthy? Yes. Did you have breakfast today? Yes. Did you do exercising before that? Yes. <laughs> Did you come here with an eco-friendly transportation mode? Do you believe that you did, you ever possibly could to support your well-being? No. All right. And now you, the question is, why? And maybe you wonder, around, OK, I would like to exercise more often, but the, but the park is too far. Oh, I would like to ride bike more often, but there are no bike lanes in my neighborhood. Or I would like to consume more eco-friendly, and organic food, but the supermarket is four, five more miles away from here. And all these questions oftentimes shape your routines. And certainly, it's an environment. Environment is built around us that oftentimes limit, oftentimes inhibit our dream or our willingness to be healthy. So this is how our present cities oftentimes are blind are ignorant and are restrictive. So I'm going to talk about future cities that feel, that understand, and that care. So let's look back to these examples. So environment is one thing. And according to social psychology, that's a, one of the two very strong determinants on your behavioral choices. And as already told, so we can try to put the bike lanes, we can try to put organic food all around us. We can try to re-engineer our cities. But it's going to take years. It's going to take a lot of money. And the question is, is there anything else we can do right now, today? And there is. The other aspect that determines our behavior is our attitude. Our attitude towards the behavior. And what can support our attitude? It's a motivation. So oftentimes, you have been in a situation that there, you have felt like, OK, somebody wants me to do something. And the conventional ways that have been used in research and also in a practice, they're quite simple. Carrots and sticks. So imagine if somebody tells you, OK, here's the money for you. Do the exercise tomorrow. You will think, ah, oh, depending on what kind of money it is, how worth it is. Maybe I'll do it. And then the stick is actually that you are taking the money away from you. For example, if you ride non-eco-friendly transportation mode, you might pay a larger tax for your car. Or you have been in a situation that you see, OK, you, bill, you, you, you are offered a discount for a gym membership which tries to pull you in. So those are the methods that you have experienced on yourself. So either some benefit for you, some incentive, or some kind of punishment if you don't do the right thing. Think again. How long-lasting are the effects of these two? As long as somebody does that. As long as somebody gives you money, as long as somebody gives you a discount, as long as somebody punishes you. When that's taken away, what people naturally do, or more often do, they revert back to the behaviors they had before. Now is the question, can we do, is there anything beyond that? Is there anything other source of motivation? And the answer, there is. We oftentimes forget that we are so much influenced by the presence of other people. Social sciences tell us we learn from others. We compare ourselves with others. We look for social norms. We are much more motivated to run a marathon on a day of the marathon, because we know there are going to be other people. We don't wake up one day and think, oh, I'm going to run a marathon. We like cooperate, we like compete, and we like to be recognized for our good behavior. So those are the techniques that we can implement in the future cities to improve the behaviors of those who want. And it's a very important thing to remember is that there, there's going to be always people 
who will never change whatever you propose to them. They're self-contained. Maybe you know some of them. There are people who are strong enough, who have high levels of motivation that they can change themselves, whatever it takes. Have you seen bicyclists in the wintertime? Yes. In Boston, <laughs> except the blizzard days. <laughs> so there are these two groups, and there is the one group in the middle. And I typically refer to this group as people of January 1st. <laughs> so we would like to change. We just need some extra motivation. And I propose that the social influence from the other people as the most perpetual, more persistent, and the strongest influence we ever have and always around us. And we need to build our future cities or re-engineer our cities with these elements to be on the surface. Let's look back to that example of the grocery store that possibly have organic food or not. You stand with your shopping cart and you pick stuff in it. And then the one person comes along you and the shopping cart is full with vegetables and fruits. You think, must be an exception, right? And then you see the second coming, very similar shopping cart. Third, fourth, 10. What do you think? Maybe I'm the exception. And imagine you can see hundreds of these people, or thousand, and then you, now you think, oh, I cannot see. My physical limits of far, how far I can see, I might be see 10 or 100. 100 maybe not, 10 or 50. But then again, what we do have today is the technology. We have sensing. All the products are scanned at the counter. Actually, we have this information. It's just about how we think we can repackage that and display through the urban, ubiquitous environment in the same grocery store. We just use the data, put the big display, and say, today, the average shopping cart had 70% of healthy food in it. And then we find ourselves standing with the broccoli in one hand and with a hamburger in the other, trying to decide what to do next, what to do next. <laughs> and then we suddenly look up and, wow, 70% of the shopping cart was healthy. Look at our own. All right. <laughs> so this is how powerful the social influence is. The same can be applied to looking at transportation. So if you ride a car to work, let's say you cross the Harvard Bridge here in Boston next to the MIT. And while you cross the bridge, how many bicyclists you see there? 10, maybe 20. What if we put a sensor and we put a counter and we put a big display? You come back from work and you see a number which says 2,500. What do you think? There are people doing that. After some time, and you see every day this 2,000 or 3,000, you start to question yourself, why I can't do it? This is how powerful the social influence is. You see other people doing the right behaviors, the healthy and sustainable, and that provides you extra motivation, especially for the group of January 1st who want to do that. They see other people doing it. And if you look at another example, if you have changed the light bulbs from the regular to the energy efficient in your apartment in a residential building, your frames might be illuminated in a night. And the more apartments have changed, the more illumination goes on around your building. And one day you come home, and only your frames are dark. And you know that everybody else sees that too. So those are the examples of how persuasive cities in the future are going to provide everyone with the extra motivation just by providing and, and enabling people to see that there are similar others performing healthy and sustainable routines regardless of the built environment which would, as I said, would take much longer and much more money and much more effort to rebuild. What we could do today, we can today build persuasive cities that enable us to receive extra motivation just by harnessing, just by exemplifying how many people have that. And we just experience, and these future cities gonna feel what's going on in your neighborhood, 
they're going to understand by using big data analytics. And by the way, through the big data analytics, you would clearly figure out that there are distinct groups, like the, the best ones, that always eat healthy and use eco-friendly transportation modes and stuff like that. And there will be always that are like lacking behind. There are different kind of groups in, in, in the middle of that. And what you're going to do, you just use the top group to exemplify and design interventions for the group at the bottom and see how that plays out. And that means that for those people who would like to receive extra motivation, they will receive it through this kind of uh, urban feedback channels. And you know, I would like to leave you with a final picture, because it's all about cities. And if you even change slightly a street light color to green for those areas, for those residential uh, buildings and bigger communities with a slightly green, and you know that you can, when you, in the night, take off with a plane, you see the big city under you. Imagine that's, for example, Boston. And you clearly see which regions are taking care of themselves more often, which are more healthier, just by seeing the green light present there. And it's not only giving you opportunity to decide where to live in a certain city, but it also provides you to compare cities. So maybe you land in Chicago, and you remember the picture from Boston, and you remember the picture from Chicago. And from the skies above, you can compare which is more greener. So I would leave you with a thought that even though the re-engineering and rebuilding cities will take long, what, you, what we can do right now, we can enable everyone to see what other people are doing by building persuasive cities that feel, that understand, that care. Thank you.